hello, church, uh, brethren and sisters, uh, to all the saints and any seekers who may be joining us this morning. Uh, I'm going to be filling in for Pastor Curry uh, for this Wednesday's Midday Manor, and I am Deacon Sam Carney. Today I thought what we would do uh, while we get ready for this is give you a chance to get your Bible and your study resources. We are going to the Old Testament, uh, the book of Micah, M-I-C-A-H. So we're going to be studying from Micah. Uh, it's a small uh, book. Our particular concentration is going to be on the sixth chapter. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by giving just a little bit of background and context, uh, talk about some of the things that were going on, and then we're going to move over to, to chapter 6 and spend a little, the majority of our time uh, studying those scriptures. Hopefully we will be able to make some, some applications to our own lives, uh, to see parallels from then and uh, today. So as we get ready to get started, uh, may we bow our heads. Dear Holy Father, we come in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We come thanking you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to hear your word, to teach your word, to meditate on your word. And we pray that during this session, dear Lord, that the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, will lead and guide us into understanding and truth. This we ask in your name. Amen. Okay, uh, let's get started here. First and foremost, uh, Micah was a prophet, and he was God's prophet. He was called of, of God to give a message to the nations of Israel and Jerusalem. Now, you know and I'm just going to talk about this a little bit, King David had unified Israel. His son Solomon had brought Israel to a, a pinnacle of, of uh, recognition in the world uh, because of all that Solomon had done and the beautiful temple he had built. And when Solomon died, the kingdom was divided. And ten tribes remi remained in the north, and they were often known as Israel. And two tribes in the south uh, was the center of, that was Judah, and the uh, center of Jerusalem, that was the capital. And these factions had some, some wars going on um, amongst each other. Sometimes they were allies. The thing about Israel in the south is that it was based on false worship. When the kingdom was divided, they set up a golden calf and they started to worship in a way that was um, antithetical to God, that was not of God. And uh, as it goes on, they were ruled over by many, many bad kings. And we know when we uh, look at the book of Kings that uh, when Ahab was king, it says that of all the bad kings, Ahab was the worst of the lot. So God sees this. Now we know that the whole of Israel uh, was called by God to be his people, God's people. And they had a directed way that they were to worship, to live, to serve, to how they were to relate to one another, how they were to relate to God. Uh, one last point about the divided kingdom. Now, sometimes it can be confusing because we will call it all Israel, but generally uh, in, in Micah, Israel refers to those 10 uh, northern tribes, and uh, Judah refers to those two um, tribes in the in the, in the uh, south. Michael was born there in the south, but his call was really to all of Israel. 
You know, sometimes religion can be come so commonplace that we just go through the motions of worship and serving God and knowing the right words to say uh, and the, the platitudes to reach. And sometimes it has no real spirit or meaning or life in our lives. And so God had watched what had gone on. He had watched the, uh, the falling away, the false worship, the mistreatment of uh, neighbors, the corruption of leaders, and God sent prophets. Now we understand that there was a priesthood and all, and, and, and there were some godly people uh, living during these times. But when we talk about, you know, a little leavening, beginning to leaven the whole loaf, you had such widespread uh, corruption and falling away. Much like today. We can have a semblance of godliness, but not really have it in our hearts. So Micah was called to bring the word of God to the people, both in Jerusalem and there at Samaria. He was called to do that. And being called of God, you know, a couple of years ago, or a few years ago, uh, Al Gore wrote a book, uh, I think it was entitled An Inconvenient Truth. Well, Michael had to bring inconvenient truth to the people. And even as today, we don't like to hear inconvenient truths. And what that is is that it is true, it is absolutely true, but it doesn't fit into our belief system or what we want to have, so we want to dismiss it. We don't even want to hear it. So this was Michael's job. And what a tough job there was, because there were other prophets who were saying, oh, everything is fine. You know, they were looking at it in rose-colored uh, glasses. They were advising the leaders, oh, oh, nothing's going to happen. And then, even if it happens, it's not going to last that long if we, if we overrun anything like that. Uh, but Michael had to bring the truth. And so what he does is he, he the, the book of Micah is, can be divided into three parts. The first part has to do with chapters 1 and 2, in which he talks about God is coming in judgment. You know, God may be delaying uh, the judgment that he's going to bring upon these two nations, but if you do not change your ways, God is coming in judgment. And that should get all our attention because uh, <clears throat> we know that God's judgment is a righteous judgment. God knows the heart. We see the outward appearance, but God knows the heart. The chapters 3 through 5 talk about uh, God is going to come uh, in peace. God gives us an opportunity. God gives us. In fact, Peter says in his letter that uh, God's delay, uh, Christ's delay in return, has to do with giving us an opportunity. It is not his will that any should be lost. So he wants to give us an opportunity. So he delays the coming. So we have to use that and hopefully see that and, and repent if that's what we uh, need to do. And then the uh, last part, verses 6 through 7, he talks about God is coming in, in mercy and, and God is going to be pleading with the people. And that's going to be, that chapter 6 is going to be kind of the focus of our, our study. Of course, we know the, the key lesson out of uh, the entire book of, of uh, Micah is do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God. So that's going to be kind of the way that, that we're going to go here. Now, being a prophet, we know that... Uh, what the prophet says, what the test of a true prophet is that what he prophesies comes true. We know that when Elijah in 1 Kings uh, uh, gave Ahab the prophecy, he says it's not going to rain for several years. Not, not only rain, there's not even going to be any dew in the land. Except when he speaks the word of God. 
that came true. The same, we hear many people today, and we've heard them recently, recently in some of the upheavals that have been going on in our country, hear people say what God has said and what God is going to do through various people. And when that doesn't come about, that shows that that's a false prophet. Now, I want to emphasize right here and now that for us who are known as Christians, we can go to the first chapter of Hebrews. And in that first chapter, the word tells us, and you can check this, read this in your, your uh, spare time, that, that during various times and in sundry ways and places, God spoke through the prophets. But in these days, he's spoken through his son, Jesus. So Jesus is the one we're to listen to. So let's go, let's go here. We, we, we see that uh, we're going to go right to chapter, uh, we're going to go right to chapter 6 here. And we're going to do some readings. Most of the readings that I'm going to do are going to be uh, <clears throat> from the New International Version. Okay, in chapter 6, it says, Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusations. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. In this chapter, the, the Micah is stylizing uh, this, this uh, uh, confrontation or this encounter with God and the people in the terms of a legal kind of sense. It says, uh, God said, plead your case again. What have I done that has caused you to go astray in such a way? Plead your case. If you have something, if there's some reason, plead it. And you're going to be pleading this before the mountains and the hills. And when I, when I hear this and think of this, I think of uh, these are things that were foundational in creation. When you go back to that story of creation, and he created the earth and all that we see here. These things are also symbolized as being long-lasting or everlasting until this earth is dissolved. But he, he's saying here, Let's plead the case. Let, let, let the elements of nature hear your plea. Because they have been here since the beginning. Let them hear the plea. Make, make your case. Make your best case here. Uh, <clears throat> and you're going to be pleading it to this everlasting foundation here. So in verse 3, he goes on and says, My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. And then he says, uh, <laughs> I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you. He, go, he recounts all of the blessed things that he has done for Israel. This is a list of things that I have done based on his love and his mercy. So he says, what have I done? Have I done evil to you? Or have I done righteously by you? And that is a question that sometimes we have to be reminded of. We can get in a situation in life, a circumstance in life, and uh, you know, sometimes our faith can slip and we can say, you know, God, what do, why aren't you helping me? Why have you abandoned me? And maybe we need to call to mind is, really, has God done anything evil to me? Or has God's actions only been for my good? And that'll make us change our, our thoughts. So he goes down into to verse 6 and he says, what shall I come before the Lord uh, and bow down before the exalted, exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? 
and 10,000 uh, rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression? So he's asking the people, when we think about this, what really pleases God? Now he had instituted uh, a system of worship for the people, and that was good to remind them of God's goodness and God's involvement in their lives and to uh, that they needed to keep God foremost in their lives, and that's what we do with worship. But he says, <laughs> when, when we are, uh, but what is going to please him? If I just go through the motions of religion and worship, is that enough? They are helpful things in turning our attention to God. The burnt offerings, uh, being able to make the sacrifices, uh, rivers of olive oil, are those things really what pleases God? In other words, we're asking, what can I give? What can I give to make it right, Lord? Uh, if I realize I have messed up, what do I need to do? And we might stylize it today in a different kind of fashion, you know. Well, I, I'm going to go and do some, some volunteer work. I'm going to give X amount of my income to this, that, or the other. And that might be good. Those might be good things. They might be good. But can we buy God off by giving him things? You know, uh, in, in psychology and in, in, in uh, defense mechanisms, the things we do to, to, you know, tell ourselves that we're doing a good job, kind of, uh, there's a mechanism called undoing. And when I was reading this scripture, I was thinking about that. Undoing is when you uh, mess up, <laughs> you know, you do something uh, uh, that's not pleasing to your spouse or a friend or someone else, and you realize that you have messed up, well, the husband might go and bring uh, flowers or a box of candy. That's kind of old fashioned, but they might do that in an attempt to undo. The wife might cook his favorite meal, or we might do something nice for the person. You know, I, I'm just being thoughtful, I'm just doing something nice. I know that I had harmed it. Those kind of things. But we know in our own relationship, for example, that when words come out of our mouths, we can't call them back. We can't apologize, and that, that's good. That's good for repair. But when they're out there, they're out there. So the people are kind of asking, and, and God said, what can you do to please me? With all your religiosity and your formality, is that really pleasing me? And again, that brings us down. We can attend church every Sunday. We can do all the things that we've been taught to do that are good religious behaviors. But is that what really pleases God? But I think it says down here, uh, it says, what does the Lord require of you? And this brings us to the, uh, the, the heart of our lesson here today. What does the Lord require of you? to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. We're talking about godly integrity, right? We have to uh, act, or we gotta act justly, we gotta love mercy, we gotta walk humbly. These are action verbs, right? Acting, loving, walking in alignment to God's word. It is, it is one thing to uh, nominally wear the title of Christian and talk about uh, perhaps the uh, offices and the ministries we serve in in our local congregations or the positions that are held. But really, what happens, what, what matters rather, and what makes those uh, things that we're involved in really pleasing to God is what is our inner spiritual life like. What is that? And God, as he starts out in, in, in this chapter here, 
is talking about, or in this book, is talking about judgment. And God is a righteous judge because he sees us as we are. He knows our thoughts before they're even formed. So he knows us. He knows when we're being sincere and who he knows when we're just putting on an act. But he tells the people, this is what it's about. See, because the people, they had gotten so far away from God, we know that Israel was involved in false worship, but we know that Jerusalem, uh, uh, where Jesus was coming through that line, uh, we, we know that they had even, they had had good kings and bad kings, but there were times when they were off track, when they were not being observant as they should. And so when we start, the point I'm wanting to make is when we start falling away from God, neglecting the things of God, not walking integrity with integrity with God, then our relationships with one another start to fall apart. Uh, the people had began uh, cheating in their measurements. They were taking advantage. They were not uh, really caring for the, for the most vulnerable people in the society. Leaders were kind of doing whatever they wanted to do, whatever they thought was right. So really the, the fabric of society begins to fall apart. And you know when, when, uh, when our leaders and people out in the uh, forefront, when they start to uh, fall away and do whatever they want, there's going to be some influence that trickles down. Well, if they're doing it, uh, I can do it. We all have to be accountable unto God, individually and collectively as a society. Uh, we have heard recently uh, a, a lot of different things that have gone on in our country. And sometimes the question I think about is, where are the godly people? Where are we? When we see that, that lives and uh, lies and mistreatment is taking place, where are we? Many times, uh, people who are implementing policies and laws that have negative effect on some group of people, they don't think they're doing anything wrong. But we as Christians have to always recenter and realign our thoughts and actions with God. So it says, well, what if, if, if all of these things that are associated with formalized worship and all uh, uh, the, the offerings and all of these things, if that is not going to please him, what does? And he tells us it's really a state of our heart, right? He says, first of all, you have to act justly. <laughs> Do the right thing. Remember that old movie title? Do the right thing not just talk about justice, but to actually do what we can. Now, I know when we talk about these things, sometimes what gets overwhelming to us is the fact that the problem seems so big or the area is so massive. What could I possibly do? Uh, you know, what the little bit that I'm able to do would not be helpful at all. So I'm just not gonna do anything. Uh, kind of like the uh, young man who uh, buried his talent, right? Well, it's just too much. I'm not going to be able to, to please the master, so I'll just keep it. And we know the outcome of that. But sometimes we may feel that way. We may feel so overwhelmed uh, and that our resources are so small. But remember the widow of Zarephath when Elijah told her to, to, to take her last uh, uh, flour meal and, and make a cake for him. You know, what in the world are you talking about? It's all we've got. Sometimes we have to take what we consider the little that we have and allow God to multiply it. We need to do what is just. So no matter how big the ocean is, we need to do our part. Our boats may be very small, but wherever you are, 
do what you can. Stand up for justice. Don't let, uh, uh, don't let lies stand and perpetuate lies when we know they're lies. And sometimes that, that's an amazing human capacity. We can know, we can have evidence that the thing, the event, the whatever is not true and yet we will not speak for the truth. We must have godly integrity. Godly, and I say godly integrity as a, what I'm differentiating between that and religious uh, integrity is sometimes we can be loyal to a sect or a group, but we need to know and seek to find out what God wants, and he wants us to act justly. When we see injustice, let's do what we can. There's an old saying that evil triumphs when good men, and I'm going to substitute that good men with Christian, when Christians will do nothing. Yes, God is sovereign. Yes, God does have the whole world in his hand. But God has a work that he wants us to do on earth. And what he calls us to do, he will empower us to do it. We sometimes can get so caught up into who, what, when, how is it going to do. And that sometimes will keep us from doing it. We just need to act on God's word. The next thing uh, that Micah uh, brings out here is we have to love mercy. Love, mercy, giving someone else something they don't deserve. And when we give someone something that they don't deserve, that bestows grace upon them because grace <clears throat> is that unmerited favor, right? I didn't deserve it, but I got it. So we, as children of God, we need to love mercy, love mercy. Uh, we, we want to be sure that we're going to uh, be doing, trying as much as we can to be instruments of good in this life. Not making judgments about people. And sometimes uh, we in the church will do this. Uh, a person may need some help. And the conversation may center too much around uh, do they have a job? You know, what did they do with their money? Uh, you know, are they doing this? Are they doing that? Sometimes we have to meet the need of the person. And if they are unjust, that is on them. I'm not saying that we need to just, you know, wholesalely, uh, 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 you know, do whatever, but we do it uh, in a spiritual, uh, earnest way. We help them, and maybe that crisis that we help them with, we may need, then need to bring them in or to reach out to them for other ways. If you got in this situation, how can we help uh, change the circumstances of your life. How can we help do that? Now, Micah is talking to the nation of Israel and Judah. These are God's people. So this word is for us, those who have been called according to his name and his purpose, Jesus Christ. He is, is talking to us to keep us on the straight and narrow. What the word does to those who are seekers, hopefully it will prick their hearts and cause them to come into salvation. So we in this uh, beloved community have to be willing to have mercy towards one another. You know, there's a, an old saying that uh, the church, so to speak, is the only army that shoots his wounded. Sometimes when people uh, in our congregations are suffering and hurting, uh, we will talk about them. We won't uh, really have mercy on them, right? Uh, 
being in America, we, we think of rugged individualism. They need to do it for themselves. But the scripture tells us we need to love mercy. Because sometimes when we make these judgments that we shouldn't make, then we don't know all of the facts. The third thing he says is to walk humbly with your God. We ought not to get the big head, right? Uh, we ought to esteem others better than ourselves. We need to have humility. We don't want to boast. Uh, only thing we can boast about is in uh, it boast in God and what God has done, giving him all of the glory. That's who we boast in. So, but we have to be humble with people because sometimes we can... Uh, we can uh, try to, to intervene in someone's situation in their life, and we can come across so arrogant or superior that it almost nullifies the good act that we are attempting to do. You know, some people will say, well, if you feel that way, think that way, have that kind of attitude, uh, you may as well keep it. But we want to be humble. Because we're humble before the Lord. We want to be humble with our, with our fellow man. And as I said, the scripture tells us to esteem others better than ourselves. So many times <clears throat> what we are doing is uh, we are thinking only of I. I. But we should think of thou. We should think of others. So uh, Micah has laid this out for us and he calls us to to uh, reflect on what God truly requires of us now uh, in John the gospel of John 13th chapter verses 34 and 35 it says a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And this is the key verse, 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love, have love one to another. That's our mark, isn't it, as a Christian? Uh, <clears throat> so therefore, we know that as, as Micah prophesied that Jesus would be born, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of years before it came about. We also know that as we work and live, that even though God has uh, delayed the time, Jesus has delayed his, his return, we can go to Acts, the first chapter, verse 11, in which the angel said to the men who were watching Jesus as he ascended into heaven, men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. We are not to just be waiting on sidelines. We are to be busy. And one way for us to be busy, as Micah has said, is to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. May we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word, to hear your word again. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we will meditate upon your word, that we will, that we will join with the Holy Spirit who is within us to quicken the word in our lives that we may go about doing good in your name. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and good day.